Hey guys, it's chapter 9, Transforming the Economy, 1800 to 1860. We'll discuss three revolutions, starting with the Industrial Revolution, how we led to factories. We'll then move on to the Market Revolution and the selling and production of all these goods. And finally, the Transportation Revolution, the actual shipping of these goods. From here, we'll move on and talk about the social classes that emerge at this point. We'll discuss some reform societies, in particular temperance, and then finish it off with immigration and nativists. So right off the top, the Industrial Revolution, these are the causes. So it was caused by expansion, abundant natural resources, entrepreneurs, these are people who establish their own businesses, capita, which is money, a cheap labor force, which was found in women and children, and mass production. Some of the effects, we'd see introduction of factories, women as workers, labor unions, affordable goods, improved and expanded transportation, the development of cities, and the increase of urban population as well as the social classes. So before the Industrial Revolution, we had what was called master craftsmen. These were people who were very knowledgeable in creating one part, but knowing all, all parts, all steps to create that part. So here we see the boss and maybe his two workers. And so this was a very intimate setting where there was friendly relationships between the employee and the employers. And in this particular case, they're creating a carriage wheel. So these three individuals knew every aspect of production for this carriage wheel. It took them a while, but that's how they grew their business. This was all part of a division of labor. So a division of labor is a technique where each worker specialized in one task. So in this particular case, they are doing shoes. They're making shoes. So from the master craftsman, we go into the division of labor where each individual only knew one part or only specialized in one task of creating the shoes. So one guy might be cutting the leather, the other guy might be doing the sewing, the other person might be doing the packing and the shipping. So the purpose of division of labor was to increase productivity and profit. Now, this is a small setting, but we'll see how that changes. In labors where this was not possible, they introduced the factory system. So in this particular case, the factory system, we have hooks that move a particular product along the way. And you see on the floor, these are color-coded. Color so the colors represent something that each individual made. So for example, in this, in this beef plant, these hooks carry the livestock from one place to another where specialized workers completed a given task. For example, splitting the cow right off the top, trimming the carcasses, inspection, re-inspecting it, and then shipping it. So it creates now a mass force of labor. All these factories were being powered by water. So this is a water mill. So the water comes on here, it pushes the water down, and then that spins this shaft right here, which then spun other shafts and gears inside the factory. And then these pulleys also work to help with the manufacture of whatever the product is. It looks like here they're doing, they're working with grain, possibly wheat. But most common than not at this point, again, that's the shaft that was being spun by some of these gears from the water mill. And then it was then spun to these individual machines. In this particular case, that has to do with textile. So a major textile factory is the Lowe system or the Lowe factory. Francis Cabot Lowe introduced the Lowe system. Basically, he hired girls from local farms, offered them rooms and boarding houses, evening lectures and cultural activities. To promote their parents to send these girls to work, Lowe banned alcohol, he set up curfew and required constant church attendance. Now these girls sometimes were willing to go because they wanted to go and help out their families. So the money that they used was either to use to pay off their father's debt, pay for their brother's colleges, for themselves to prepare for, uh, for marriage, or some of them simply went to work in the factories because they were bored at the farm. Now, Factory work was not easy. These girls worked six days a week, 12 hours per day. And there were young girls between the as, as early or as young as the age of eight. So these textiles were then sent to textiles factories. So this is where we have the market revolution. Now we're producing the items. So these girls get the entire fabric and then they are sewing it into, it looks like dresses of some form here. And notice at the very back, strive to excel. So it was a constant reminder that working women were striving to excel to improve society. 
this was unseen before the industrial revolution before the market revolution most of these girls prior to the industrial revolution were at home working sewing their own personal clothing making candles making soap but now they're providing these goods for a market to be sold men worked also in factories so here they were doing coal burning coal for some form of steel production and of course since you have all these products we also need new machines innovation the singer sewing machine is one of the most important ones so singer created this machine by 1877 the singer machine controls 75 percent of the world's market for sewing machines so he was making a lot of money by selling the sewing machine because of the product that was available but that was just one example there were many many more manufacturers goods that were being shipped and sold here kind of gives you an idea um you know cotton lumber boots clothing iron uh leather even liquor so this is the market revolution we're producing all these goods and selling it to to different people around the u.s and also across the world now one of the major inventions that helped all this was Eli whitney's cotton engine so in 1793 he introduced the cotton engine basically what it is the slaves were picking up all this cotton and inside the cotton you have these seed balls those seed balls needed to be removed to have clean cotton which was then used to um, produce the fabric that was then used to make the cloth so this particular product automatically removed the seed and it provided for clean cotton the impact of this it actually increased slavery because prior to this machine the cotton gin slaves needed to pull the seeds by hand and so now this machine was able to do the work of 10 slaves in one hour the other thing that Italy would to introduce was interchangeable parts so interchangeable part was making these items out of numerous parts and if one of those parts broke then it was easy to identify it by these numbers and then instead of making the whole item brand new then you just produced that one product so interchangeable parts also increased the production and here was a rifle that was being introduced an effect of the uh, market revolution the industrial revolution and interchangeable parts was also an increase in productivity in terms of harvest so here this is McCormick uh, William McCormick was a major major revolutionary in the harvest in agriculture field so he introduced what becomes known as a McCormick Reaper so these two guys uh, being that's his dad and that's his son they're harvesting wheat and they were able to harvest wheat by this machine seven times faster than men would and these letters again were used to identify the part that was needed in case one broke rather than creating the whole thing brand new then you just told the manufacturer you just need one part part a and then they will reproduce it for you and here's an example of what would go on in the factories so this is men working in the factories and notice here is a foreman in other words kind of like the supervisor and all these guys are workers so it produced dozens of workers in a fast-paced environment now employers had limited if any communication with his employees if you recall the craft masterman, the master craftsman, he was able to communicate with the two workers that he had. But here, he's not able to communicate with everybody. Bosses were now more concerned with making money. And so these wage earners, the workers, they felt that they were under the authority of a supervisor. And as such, that undermined republicanism because now one person is above everybody else, which is something that they didn't like. Workers also despise working long hours for low wages, and as such, they started to form unions to fight for their own um, goods. In the major Supreme Court case, Commonwealth versus Hunt in 1843, granted workers the right to form unions and if needed, to strike. So we started seeing that industrialization did have its negative impacts. A lot of these factories spur all along rivers, so you see the rivers here, for ease of transportation. But we also see the introduction of railroads, and that's what you see here, these railroads. So factories were really near transportation methods. Here's a map that shows you the canals and the railroads and uh, navigable rivers that were introduced. Notice most of them are in the Northeast and what becomes known as the Midwest. Recall, in Chapter 7, I believe, we talked about the National Road, which started more or less in Pennsylvania and ended up in Chicago. We also had the Erie Canal that we talked about that connected New York and the Midwest through the the major lakes and the Erie Canal was an instant economic success but there was an ecological impact where thousands of trees were cut down to make room for homes crops and grazing of livestock 
but New York became a predominantly, predominantly state of trade. By the mid-1800s, New York handled half of foreign trade. The Midwest over here, in these states right here, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, they were producing crops and lumber. So they shipped lumber and crops to the east and down here to the west as well. It's important to realize as well that the South, for the most part, most part stayed an agricultural society. And you don't see the development in the South the way you see it in the Midwest and in the Northeast. And that also begins to distinguish the different regions in the country. So the Midwest and the East, people grew wealthier. They improved society. Their roads were better and their lifestyles were better as well. Here's on the map that shows you just the expansion of railroads. Again, most of it is in the Northeast, expanding to the West or Midwest. And then the Midwest was also connected by canals and rivers. This um, picture kind of symbolizes everything that we talked about. So we talked about water and the water mills, and then those produced factories that were producing goods, and then those goods were being shipped through steam power, be that a steam boat or a steam railroad, and some of the goods that we talked about here, manufacturing for agriculture as well. So the Industrial Revolution ties into the Market Revolution, which ties into the Transportation Revolution, because there's no point of producing all these goods if you cannot ship them. So this is why they're all tied in. The telegraph eventually becomes really important as well because it was used to communicate with customers to take the orders and check on arrivals as well. Now all these things, the industrial revolution, market revolution, and transportation revolution leads to a population growth as well. So you see we're talking about 1800 more or less to about the 1840s. Here is the total population. So in the 1800s, there was about 5 million people. And this includes slaves as well. And by the 1840s, a more than uh, triple the population. So the effect of the Industrial Revolution, it increased urban populations. In some city, population increased fourfold to over four to over one million people. Cities like New York, Boston, and Chicago. So those these cities were all connected via the railroads, canals, and roads. Now the other major effect of the Industrial Revolution was social classes. We have three social classes: the elite, the middle class, and the working class. So. This is kind of gives you the characteristics of who these people were. So the elite were merchants, manufacturers, bankers, and landlords. Usually they own large parts of land, which they rented out. They wore tailored clothing, rode in fancy carriages, bought expensive furniture, and some of them started to live in separate neighborhoods. See, before industrialization, it was difficult to distinguish people by their economic status because most people ate and wore similar items. But the Industrial Revolution creates the social classes and against challenge republicanism because now people are no longer equal economically. There is a structure of who's on top and who's at the bottom. So that was the elite. The middle class was composed of farmers, contractors, mechanics, and some tradesmen. They live in what becomes known as handsome homes, not as good as the elite. Uh, they bought books, panels, lithographs, stoves, sewing machines so they could create their own um, clothing at home, and comfortable furniture. And since most of these work for the most part long, long hours, they also hired domestic servants to work at home. And a lot of these domestic servants were Irish and African Americans. Their children went to high school and that was very, very rare. At that point, most of the children actually only reached the fifth grade. So because they had a little bit more money, they were able to afford to send their children to high, to high school. And as such, children strive at riches through education. And finally, the working class, so these are poor whites and predominantly African Americans. They worked in they were construction workers working in the canals. They were loaders, loaded cargo to be shipped back and forth. And again, they were domestic servants that worked in people's homes. Their annual income was about a hundred dollars a year, which was about three thousand dollars in our day. And as such, they lived in debt and they lived in poorly ventilated apartments, in particular in New York. They were they were rat infested as well. And diseases were very common. Many of them died because of diseases and famine since they didn't have enough money to feed themselves. Their children had limited education because by the age of 10, a lot of these parents sent their children to work. And uh, finally, here is just kind of a picture of the 1800s, 1840s, an elite family with pianos, their children well-dressed, and these huge mirrors and lithographs. And you could, you could also see more or less this, this was a pretty big home.